G'day and welcome to the first ever episode of Pick and Drive Rugby Podcast. It's pretty exciting. I am Mark Ando Anderson and with me is uh, Mitch Mitch Foster. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, excited. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty fun time. I'm I think what the world needs more is some white guys doing podcasts. So 100%. I'm glad we can contribute to that. Yeah, definitely. All right. So what are our um, our point of differences? Like why do people want to listen to us? Look, I think for me, one of the things I love about Australian rugby is that you've got some really good podcasts out there. Mm-hmm. You've got Green Gold Rugby Podcast. They do some awesome work with the regular crew, but also with the Rugby Report card. You've also got more recently the um, Rugby Ruckus. The problem is particularly with the Green and Gold guys, and definitely with Rugby with uh, Rugby Report card, they're not family friendly. Yeah. And they're not always the most regular as well. And I think we can be a point of difference in both those areas. Yeah, let's do it. I've got, um, adding to that, I've got a couple of small kids and I like to listen in the car to and from work. And one of the things I really find challenging is when there's a lot of swearing going on. And like, I'm not the most PC bloke in the world, but I also don't want my four-year-old to be dropping F-bombs. So... I don't think rugby is (laughs) also a game that requires swearing either. Yeah, well, maybe not when you're commentating about it. No, that's but it. Maybe on the field. Maybe on the field, but you know, white line fever, <coughs> get across the line, you leave it on the field. So. I am going to give us a bit of a understanding of what the schedule for tonight will be. And it's kind of going to look the same moving forward, maybe with a little segments that drop in and out each week. So our main focus of what we're going to be doing here at Pick and Drive Rugby is the Australian Super Rugby game. Mm-hmm. We'll also be covering internationals when they come around, but realistically, we're looking at the Australian Conference in Super Rugby. So all the commentary that we do will be based upon the four Aussie teams, and we, I mean, we might touch on the Sunwolves, but realistically, we're going to talk about the Aussie teams. That's it. So we'll do a recap of each game, and then if there's any general news or commentary, and we love to speculate over who will be in the Wallabies team, particularly with the new Dave Rennie era. Yeah, so such an exciting era. It's, it's pretty fun. We're going to have a whole bunch of young guns, hopefully, coming into the Wallabies team. And what better time to make ridiculous claims about who's going to claim a Wallaby jersey than kind of week four, week five of the Super yeah, Rugby season. Yeah, that's right. Um, because, you know, everyone's got their uh, standard form nailed out by now so exactly uh morgan to renew loves to claim a body of work and i think four games is good enough to claim that so why don't we move on to the first game mitch okay so first game we're looking at tonight is the highlanders and rebels game so quick score overview highlanders that's that's wrong that's wrong 22 rebels 28 that is wrong (laughs) okay so we're we're starting out as an exciting (laughs) first victory For an Australian side away from home. Rebels 28, Highlanders 22. A lot of good positives in this game. Yeah, I actually watched it. I didn't catch the game on a Friday night, but I watched it Saturday morning. And I was really, really impressed. Um, The Rebels managed to play with a level of intensity and kind of clinical finishing that they hadn't had previously. Mm. I think they really benefited, well, they obviously benefited from the fact they got two runaway tries to Andrew Killaway, who was surprisingly fast. Yeah, I was really surprised. I don't think we've seen that kind of form from Killaway for a few years now. I mean, when he was was in the schoolboys, he was doing really well, um, coming through, scoring a lot of tries. But, I don't know, I think when he was with the Waratahs, he didn't quite get the... The game time he needed, he was kind of behind, um, I think at the start he was behind Drew Mitchell and Adam Ashley Cooper, and mm-hmm. then he's also playing fullback under Kurtley Bill, uh, Kurtley Bill and Israel yeah. Falau, so yeah. didn't really get enough game time there to sort of progress. He went across to Northampton after that in the championship, um, not championship, premiership. And he, actually, I watched a few of the games there, and he was playing fairly well but again, didn't obviously seem to set the world afire, and so he's come back to Australia. And, I mean, off the basis of the last couple of games, he scored a try in the last match, I'm pretty sure. Um, scored two this time. And what was impressive was, I really liked on his runs, when he realised he didn't have the legs to do the straight run to the line, yeah. he changed the angle of the That's run. That's right, yeah, and um, I think the, the first one definitely, I think it was the first one, where he went for the corner, mm. and I thought, oh, is he, is he going to get caught here? Does, yep. does he have the legs? But yep. he, he made it, so yep. well done. Um, Haylett Petty. Yep. Dane Haylett Petty. I think... I'm not sure if he's underrated. I just don't think he does the really flashy stuff that makes highlight reels all the time. Yeah. But 
watching the game, his safety under the high ball, particularly the fact that I'm a Tars fan and we've got <laughs> Curly Beal under the high ball, comparing him to Dane Hallett Petty, there's, they're just worlds apart. Yeah. Petty took every single bomb unless he was undercut and had his legs taken out from yeah. underneath him. He was just secure every single time he went up for the ball. I think he's also just got that ability, kind of like Israel Flau did, to just get high mm. as well, which mm. gives him that extra time to to get up there, position himself in such a way that he's got the best contact. Like, he's always beating the defenders to the ball as well. Like, yeah, he's always yeah. up first. Yep. Which put... And I mean, there was a few times where he kind of got his legs taken out from underneath him, which is dangerous, but yep. he was there first, so... Exactly. I mean, the two yellow cards were given, so yeah. each time, he's obviously in a right there. That's right. Um, one of the other things I really liked about Halep Petty's game, just sticking on him for a moment was he kept managing to get on the outside shoulder of the attacker when he's running with the ball. And he wasn't making clean breaks every single time. But what he was doing is just getting over that advantage line, mm. at least being dominant within that collision. Yeah. And so what that's enabling then is for the players coming in to kind of clear out over the top, they're not having to kind of go like to retreat and go back around behind a rock and mm. then drive forward. Yeah. They're able to clear out over the top, get quick ball for the next play. Yeah. And... It seems to be a little bit underrated, but I noticed he was doing it every time. Every single time, he's just getting that quick ball because he's he's not making his way to the center of the defender's mass. He's aiming for the shoulders. Yeah. And it's small and it's simple, but it matters. Yeah. So I was really impressed with his game. What did you think of Tamuwa at 10? I really liked him. Yep. Um, and we're not just fanboying over all the Rebels team right here. <laughs> but, but I really liked him because he... He's happy to take the ball to the line, and he's strong enough to be able to do that and not yep. just get absolutely destroyed. Yeah. Um, and he's got a decent passing game, mm-hmm. like a longer passing game, yep. and he's willing to make those short little tactical kicks yep. that not many others, maybe well, the CO has been doing it a little bit. Yeah, he's Harrison got a good kicking didn't game. do it particularly well this weekend. No. Um, but Tamu's kicking game was probably the best of the number 10s this weekend, at least. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, one player, I think well, I don't know if he's been overlooked the last few years. There's been a lot of contention, but Mm -hmm. how do you think Billy Meeks is going at 12? I was watching him because I really like him because he's got a fun Instagram profile. (laughs) So I really like following him on socials. And he's a bit of, I don't know, he seems like a little bit of a kind of playboy from that kind of lifestyle. Um, I don't follow him on the Instas, but... It's fun. I've got some of the other guys on there. um, He's obviously good. He's a good super rugby level player. But... I just don't see much of a particularly strong passing or kicking game. You know who reminds me a lot of? Tell me. Tom Carter. Oh, yeah. Just, he's like not he's, hated as much as Tom Carter was. He's not hated as much, definitely. <laughs> but he's also, he's been around for a while now. Like, this is yeah. four, five years now with the Rebels. But Something like that. Yeah, he's just, he's never sort of made that step up. Yeah, and I just wonder if it's... I mean, I'm no expert. I like to commentate and have opinions, but I'm not an expert. <laughs> Um, I just wonder if it's because his strengths from what I see seem to be the strength of his defense. So mm. he's a big unit and he can tackle really, really well. Yeah. Um, and he's willing to take the ball up and drive it you know, Oh, he runs hard. Hard. He does run the ball hard. And that's really beneficial. Yeah. But it's not always what you want from that's number right. 12. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. I just don't think he's got the wide set of skills. That, like, if Tamu was playing 12, which is his best position, is where he played for... Um, Leicester when he was mm. in the premiership yeah. he, he is basically a 12 just forced to play at 10 for the Rebels <laughs> Tamura at 12 is fantastic because he's strong he can defend in a line he's got a good pass and a good kick yep that's what you need and I just don't think Meeks has that and maybe that's why he hasn't made that step up to the higher levels yeah I don't know he's, he's, he's been hanging around for a while but he just mm. yeah he hasn't made that step up yeah <sighs> did you watch the game live? no I didn't I would got the um the replay, unfortunately. Okay. So you didn't see the horrific leg break. I've seen I've seen bits of it. I saw the limited replay that was on oh. on social media. It was inc- absolutely horrible. So you don't actually see exactly what happens to the poor guy. Um Lentes? Lentes? Yeah, the L-E-N-T-J-E-S. Yeah. Um you don't see exactly what happens, but there's basically a ruck. 
something happens in there to him. The ball's cleared out and the Rebels are going on attack down the left wing and they've got a massive overload. They're, they're going to score for all money. Yeah. And then the ref just blows it back urgently and you just hear this poor guy screaming on the ground. And for some reason, the camera sticks on his leg for like five or six seconds. And you see it. And you see you it. You do see it. It's, it's, it's pointing the wrong the way. The foot There's is no definitely yeah. the wrong way to where the knee is. Yeah. And... The way that he reached out and grabbed the green whistle yep. spoke of the pain yeah, he was, that the poor he was, guy was, he was in. hurting. It was bad. Um, although, in some way, it was kind of evened out. Oh, wait, no. That was a word again. Don't worry. Um, I, um, I saw something today that definitely his season's over. Oh, really? Um, okay. Well, it's broken. Well, yeah, actually, yeah, that bad. I yeah. don't know the extent of how bad it was. Okay. If it was a clean break, it would look pretty clean. Or was it the ankle? Or the ankle is pointing in the wrong direction, but maybe the knee yeah. is broken, so the ankle... I don't yeah, I don't know. know. I don't know what the outcome was, but it did say his season was over, so that is unfortunate. Yep. Not something you like to see. Yep. Um, I did think the Highlanders... We we went to the Waratahs-Highlanders trial we game did. in pre-season. We did. Um, like Hard Oval, where yeah. the Waratahs pumped the Highlanders. They did. This that seemed like a pretty different side, though. It did. Um, not surprising, considering the Highlanders didn't have any of their... Um, no. All backs at the trial game. But the thing that stood out to me was the Highlanders weren't that good. No. And against the Rebels, the Highlanders weren't that good. Yeah. Aaron Smith is miles above anybody else in that team. Yeah, he's, as you'd expect. As Yeah, I mean, he's probably up there as the best scrum half in the world. And he's just... He was so much better. Their line out was horrific. They lost so much ball, particularly because Matt Phillips was contesting it. I mean, really. in in the final minute of the game, like, this is the last play. The Highlanders have an attacking line out, what, 20 metres out from the Rebels line, and they're six points behind. Mm-hmm. So if they get a converted try, they win. Yeah. Entirely possible. The Highlanders did it to the Brumbies a week before. Oh, yeah. And... It was Matt Phillips was the one who gets up, intercepts it off a defensive line out. He chose to go up rather than just setting for the scrum, uh, the mall defense. The mall. And so it just showed the weakness that the Highlanders had at the line out, that, mm. the, that Matt Phillips was willing to do that. He knew that he had the kind of the rub over them and was confident that he'd actually get up and get the turnover, which he did. I think, unfortunately, for the Highlanders, they've lost quite a number of players this year. Mm. Um, last year. Elliot Dixon, is he still hanging around? I don't know, I'm looking up right now. He was an All Blacks. <laughs> he was on the skirts of the All Blacks for a while. Yep. Um, good second row, good line out jumper. Yep. Unfortunately, they've lost him. I think I heard in the preseason that the Highlanders were the the, t- the whole team in super, super Rugby that had lost the most caps. Oh, okay, I think yep. they had lost more caps than the Red starting team had. Oh, wow. Which. <laughs> I mean, that says two things. <laughs> that, does, that does say two things. Um, wow, that's pretty significant. I mean, well, do we want to move on from that? The Rebels got a really good win. It's their first win in 10 years away at Dunedin. Brilliant. So that's a massive... And it kick-started a pretty good weekend for Australia. Oh, yeah, Rugby 100%. Against foreign opposition. Um, so why don't we move on then? Yeah, let's do it. And we'll head to the second Friday night game, which was the Waratahs-Lions. Now, I was devastated that... My membership, I wasn't able to go to that at a stupid school function. <laughs> um, I mean, work function. But you made the effort out I did. to I Bankwest Stadium. Tell yep. me, talk to me about the stadium first. I love it. It's a brilliant stadium. Wow. Um, it's just so close. Wherever you sit, you just feel like you're right there. Mm-hmm. We were sitting in the first half, we were sitting in the second tier, so second level, um, behind the goalposts to the left, sort of looking, we were down the Lions' left-hand side, mm-hmm. uh, where the Waratahs conveniently scored all of their tries, yep. which was brilliant. But, um, yeah, like watching the boy, the boys run towards you and score the points, you yeah. felt like you were in the huddle. That's like how close it's you were. that close. Yeah, it really is. So the seats kind of and stands rise up. Really they do, yeah. From. They 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 ascend really rapidly. Mm-hmm. Um, walking up the top is a bit of a, a workout, but <laughs> no, it's brilliant. Um <laughs> wasn't a great crowd. I didn't see the the final numbers of how many were actually there. Yep. But even though it wasn't massive, it, it still you can hear yeah. it. Like the stadium, just the the noise just circles. Well, I think that's one of 
the problems that the you, you've sp- started talking about one of the problems that the Waratahs are going to have this season is the crowd numbers, mm. and that's largely because their ground's getting rebuilt. Yeah. Whether you agree or disagree with that, um, the, I as a member, I'm probably only going to be able to get to like three or four of the games because I've got a young family and I can't travel away to Wollongong on a Friday night mm. from Northern Sydney or Tamworth. Yeah, or Tamworth. Um, I think I'm going to be heading down to the Brookvale Newcastle. game. Yeah. I might. Yeah. Well, they've already had the Newcastle game. They've they have the Newcastle one? game. They've got Brookvale. I was looking at today. Yep. So we've got three more out at Parramatta. Yep. Then we play the Sun Wolves out at the cricket ground. Mm-hmm. and then Which is going to be got... horrific because that's a rubbish ground to it's play rugby. It's so bad. It's just, you're so far away. Yeah, it's the exact opposite of what you were just saying. 100%. Yeah. You just can't, it's just no atmosphere either. Yep. Uh, I went to two games there last year and the game we beat the Crusaders, which was a mm-hmm. massive effort by the Tars. They did really well. Decent crowd, but it just it felt, felt dead. dead. You're just okay. that far away. Yeah. Not a good crowd for, not a good stadium for rugby, unfortunately, but... Well, I understand what the Waratahs are trying to do as a result of that. What they've done is they're spreading their games around New South Wales because realistically they're the New South Wales Waratahs. Yep. Um, we got to chat to Lockie Swinton at the trial game at Leichhardt and that's exactly what he was saying. That they, It sucked they didn't have one home ground, but they were actually really looking forward to getting around the state and seeing different people from around New South Wales. But what that means is you don't get that... Um, that surge or that ground or that tribalism of, yeah of people that come in they go okay for the next three of the four weeks it's going to be at Bankwest Stadium or yep. it's going to be at Allianz that's it so you know that people are going to be coming back particularly if you get a ru- on a run of games imagine what the crowd would be like next week if we were playing at Bankwest again after having a really good win against the Lions yeah I mean that brings us really nicely to the game yep so the Waratahs uh, basically ended their drought. Um, I saw in a <laughs> Fox Rugby article that they were saying that I think it's the first win that the Waratahs have had since something like May last year. Um, Is it that long? It's it's a very, very long time. Far out. We went on a really bad run at the end of last season. We did. That May might be slightly wrong, but anyway, it's significantly into the tail end of last season. Yeah. Um, yeah so the Waratahs is. are currently sitting one for four. They won 29 to 17 after going out to an absolute killer. I think it was 19 nil lead in the first 20 yeah. minutes of the game. Um, you were at the game. What were your general impressions? Uh, it was good. It was really good. They came out and just, they looked hungry. Mm-hmm. They looked like they wanted to win. Um, it was dry which helped them a lot. I think the, the dry weather um, is a game plan that they're looking to play this year. Mm-hmm. I think the uh, last three games that they've had has been quite horrendously wet, yeah. um, which has resulted in a lot of drop ball, a lot of bad kicking, a lot of scrummaging, which also hasn't been brilliant. Um, but they just looked good. Their passes were sticking they they were running into some really nice holes. Yep. Um, they look the Lions looked confused in that first fifteen yep. minutes. The Lions looked shocked, generally I mean, shocked. If you think about the start of the game and the way that the balls were going to hand versus the start of the game in Newcastle against the Blues, yep. The Waratahs were trying to basically do the same thing. They had a couple of awesome breaks. I remember Beal making some really nice breaks through the yeah. midfield, but then absolutely butchering the offloads in yep. the final kind of twenty meters of the break. And it seemed that this time, just everything the Waratahs were doing was going to hand. Yeah. And maybe the bye week was exactly what they needed. Yeah, they they did change a few of their approaches, I think. It seemed in the last game against the... Was the Blues the last game? I think so. Whatever it was. The last, no, Rebels. Rebels down oh, in yeah, Melbourne. Yeah, that sucked. Um, <laughs> that did suck. Uh, <coughs> the Rebels... Blues, particularly that game, I noticed a bit more than the Rebels, but they were just looking to keep the ball alive a little too much. Mm-hmm. And they were trying to play kind of barbarian style, yep. keep the ball alive, go to ground, pop pass for the runner coming through, but they yep. just weren't ready for it. Yep. The amount of ball that went to ground from that gameplay. And the Rebels played pretty hard at the ruck. Oh, yeah. So if you're trying to do those little pop passes without committing enough for... Well, the whole point of pop pass is to not commit forward. That's straight. right. But if the Rebels are going hard at your rocks, then they're going to disrupt it every time. Yeah, but this, this time looked different. They they were making the holes. They were they were hitting the line hard, um, getting those offloads. 
probably kept the ball so that they took the tackle a bit more than mm-hmm. trying to keep the ball alive as much. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and quick, like Jake Gordon was doing well in the first 10 minutes or so, just keeping the ball, the line was just moving. Yep. Yeah. Which was good. Wasn't good kind of see. standing over yeah. it, waiting for forwards to get into position. Yeah, that's right. I think um, something that Rob Penny has been trying to instill in this new Tars pack is um, the off the ball, like the body of work. To mm-hmm. make sure that they're doing the things off the ball, and they're not just making the tackle and then, or making the run and then get up and walk to the next breakdown, yeah, okay. which I think some of the forwards unfortunately have been a bit guilty of in the last few weeks. Yeah, okay. Is someone makes a break, <coughs> Beal or Marky Mark or yeah. um, Mason? No, not Mason. What's his name? Harrison. Harrison. Um, <laughs> Poor <and> Mac Mason. <laughs> Seriously, let's just speak to that for a moment, Mac Mason. Is he understudy for Bernard Foley for the last, like, what, three seasons? Two or three seasons? If not more. Last year, despite the fact that Foley was meant to be rested because of the Wallabies' commitments and its agreement they had with Checker, he doesn't get rested mm-hmm. until the Crusaders away game. Mac Mason gets thrown in. The Waratahs get pumped. He then gets dropped for the next week. Yeah. And then in, what, the first game of the season picks up a hammy injury? Will the Harrison's. trial. It was a trial. It was a trial. It was the last trial in Queensland, in Dalby. <laughs> and then he picks up a hammy injury, and he's out now, and Harrison has stepped up and played relatively well, and Penny's just going with him to have that continuity. Like, you've got to feel for Mac Mason. I think Penny is going to give him a bit of game time when he's fit, though. You reckon? I think so. Okay. Because he has come out and said, in support of Mason, that mm-hmm. his two tens are Mason and Harrison. Yeah, okay. That he, like, there was a bit of talk after the Rebels game that, you know, bring Kirtley into 10. Yep. Uh, let's get a bit a of experience. 10. He's not a 10, but who else do we have? Mm. Um, get a bit of experience into the back line to hopefully get that ball moving a bit wider. Yep. But Ooh. Penny's decided to stick with what he's got. You yep. can see that these two uh, younger guys are the future, which, okay. credit to him, is a good thing. Yeah. And Same. we come out and get a good performance like this. So. Mm. I mean, well, Simmons was speaking post-match, Rob Simmons, the captain, about the kind of, you know, the old, oh, yeah, we've been training really well. Yeah. Um, but well, we did, trained really well, we trained, but yeah. we uh, just didn't come out and do it. We didn't execute on the day. Which, unfortunately, feels like a TARS stereotype for the well, last I few mean, years. We, we were quoting Hooper when we just said that. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but my point within that was he, he actually genuinely was speaking about how over the last four sessions that they'd had, the four really big did see that. Um, sessions since the Rebels game, that it was as though the intensity was such that it felt like they just played a full game of rugby. Yeah. And you don't do that during the season unless there's something wrong and the coach is making a point and trying to Brilliant. drastically change that. Yeah. Um, so it seemed like they responded. Now, a few other points. Um, what was the general kind of chat and commentary in the crowds about the kicking? Was anybody... <laughs> I don't know, muttering or yeah, there was did anyone lot. have voodoo dolls and sticking pins in Harrison and Beale's legs? Is that the reason why they just were horrific? I don't know what was going on, but it just was not the day for kicking. Mm. Um, but there was no reason for it. It was not windy. It wasn't raining. I I I personally don't understand how they missed so many kicks. What was Harrison like? One from three or something, and Beal was. Beal was worse. Beal was, was none not, from three. None, none from two. none from three, and the last oh. one I think he got from was nearly in front, and yep. he missed it. Yep. I mean, Beal. When's the last time we saw Curly Beal kick though? In his defence. I mean, he takes the long range ones. Actually, he doesn't even do that anymore because Reese Hodge. Reese Hodge just can thump them the from Wallabies. forty, yeah. fifty, sixty. Um. You know what, though? Watching the Sharks game, I mean, we'll get onto the Red Sharks in a bit, but watching the Sharks game, you've got Kerwin Bosch as the number 10, yeah. who's slotting them from all over the field. Everywhere. He, t- he got like a 55 or 60 metre kick um, against the Reds. And it seems that South Africans can kick. Yeah, It I seems actually... like Frenchies or Englishmen can generally kick pretty well. I remember in the Waratahs game, at one point, the Lions took a penalty... 55 metres out. Yeah. I remember turning to my brother and saying, oh, they've forgotten they're no, not in Joburg anymore. Yeah. Because obviously they're used to kicking <coughs> it from anywhere there. Yeah. And he yeah. slotted it with ease. Yep. And it's like, what is wrong like, in Australian rugby that other nations can produce kickers that must be hitting like 80%? And yet we have such an issue. Like the last player, 
I can think of who I could trust to hit a kick is Mike Harris. Yeah. Do you remember him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he was like, I loved him because he could do one thing like really well. was like 2011, 2012? Yeah, up to 15. I was looking yeah. him up before. Okay. Um, and so he was playing originally for the Reds like 2011, then went down to the Rebels and then yeah. went over to um, Leon before... Okay. F- I think he's finished up now, but he was in Japan for a year or two. Okay. Um, but yeah, you just knew Mike Harris, he'd kick the goal. Yeah. He may not run very fast, he may not tackle very hard, he may not make many breaks... But he'd kick the goals. That's it. And you just need someone in your team that's going to kick like 75 to 80%. Because the Waratahs could... I think we left... I mean, Foley was <coughs> 2014, 2015. That kind of end of the World Cup mm, 2015. Mm, yep. Foley was the guy that would kick it. Yep. Iceman. Um, that's a great moment. Twice. Yeah. <laughs> 2014 final and then yeah. 2015 semi-final. <coughs> Quarterfinal. S- Scotland. Quarterfinal. Scotland. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. Poor Scotland. Yeah. They deserve to win that game. But anyway. Um, <coughs> you, Craig, so yeah, I, I just think it's a bigger issue. Like, why are we consistently poor across all yeah. super rugby front franchises? Well, when you think about it too, how often do rugby league players miss? Like, yeah. they get it from the sideline all the time. Like, what was Hazem El Masri, the Bulldogs player, yeah. back? What, but Jonathan Thurston as well. Yeah, they're like 85%, mm. something like that. You go, what is Cam fundamentally Smith? wrong? He could sort it from anywhere. Yep. Anyway, let's move on. Um, any highlight moment of the Waratahs game for you? Uh, highlights. Um, I think just the tries. All of the tries were really good. <laughs> we love tries. Like they were forged tries as well. Yeah. I think out of we scored five tries on the weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, Angus Bell scored. Lockie Swinton scored. Yep. Tetra Faulkner scored. Did you like Lockie Swinton's swan dive? It was brilliant. Yeah, it was fun. I actually thought he went out. He enjoyed it. <laughs> I thought he went out. Okay. Watch that again. I think he lands out. Anyway. Because <laughs> um, that was right in front of us as well. I oh, saw okay. it coming. Yep. He's land- He's dived right in front of us, landed, and I'm going, his legs are out. Yep. Didn't look at it. It was fine. Um, who else scored? Angus Bell. I said that. Oh. But Angus Bell, what a try. Brilliant. It's pretty fun. Yeah. It's pretty it's fun. awesome. He's doing really well. Yeah. He's um, he's 120 kilos, but he's getting around like Hooper. Mm. He's it's it's he's a he's an exciting prospect to see how this young bloke's going to go. I really hope he doesn't get parachuted into the Wallabies, because the yeah, weakness that we have is the scrum. need to be there this scrum. year. The Waratahs scrum is really weak, mm. and you have to be selecting props for their scrum scrummaging ability. Yeah, um, scrummaging first. Then what do they offer? Mm, would you park? say though? Would you say Latu was selected for his scrummaging ability? I think Latu was selected. I mean Latu Sukka. Yeah. Um, I think he was selected for his on the ball presence to yeah. complement Hooper. I wouldn't say that he was the best line out thrower no. or the best hooker we had. Yeah. But his work off the ball was brilliant. Yeah. Who did he have on either side of him though? Yeah. So yeah. Sometimes Kepu. Kepu Sometimes or Alatoa. Alatoa. Who were both pretty darn good scrummages. And then what, Sio and, and Slipper on the other side? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Robertson I think was so. Tom Robertson was pretty good injured? Yeah. Well, yeah. Tom Robertson wasn't at the World Cup. No. No, but he was injured. Before. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just think that we just... Angus Bell did really, really well, but let's just hold off. Yeah. Let him play Super Rugby for a couple of seasons. Yeah, let's not get excited. Just, let's I mean, he's what, 19? 20, yeah. Yeah, okay. So he's 20. His props generally don't come good until they're like 30. Um, so let's just let him... Let, no, but let it's, him it's exciting to see him <coughs> running around having fun. So. Yeah, exactly. And the the um, the young guy that came on, the winger, that scored as well. I think he's doing quite well. This was his debut. Can't yes, his name. that guy whose name I'm also 23. forgetting right now in the moment. That's okay. Um, we'll come back to that, but for now, why don't you head Actually, us... before we, we go ooh, off ooh, the Waratahs... Um, what... You'll notice, everybody, we spend a lot of time on the Waratahs. We are Waratahs fans. We're actually. both members, so um, we kind of like that. <laughs> what is your opinion of Mark Nawanta Nitowasi? Mm. Is that right? Uh, I, I practice in the lead up to it, but now I'm on the spot. I'm going to switch. <laughs> Marky no. Mark. Marky Mark. Let's we'll go, go with Marky Mark, Mark for now and we'll have it for next week. Um, what's my opinion on him? Yeah. 
Um, look, he was really exciting. You and I both were super excited after the Leichhardt trial game. Yeah. Because he... what. I he just was remember this one moment. He came into a ruck, kind of in a midfield, picked the ball up, scooted through, got his shoulders through the tackle, popped an offload, and put play ran through for a try. Yeah. And he was tall, he was big, he was fast, but he was pretty elusive. He was good under the high ball as well. Yeah. Um, but since then, he hasn't improved. He's a really good finisher. He's a good finisher. So he's finishing any opportunities really, really well. But there were a couple of times, was it against the Rebels? where they're making a play and he's kind of the last defender on the wing. He doesn't stick out on his man, yeah. but he he kind of like lunges in for, for that ball. annoying winger intercept going for the ball. And you're like, no, freaking stay on your man. he got depth to play with. That's it. Um, so defensively, he's still got work to do, but that's not surprising. He's young in a team that's lacking confidence. He's, it's not surprising he's going for the Hail Mary. He's, he's a good finisher. He is often found sort of lacking in defence, unfortunately. Mm. I think he needs a little bit more work there. Um, and his handling on the weekend was not very good. They pulled him at, uh, at half-time. I think he was one of the only players on the field who dropped like three or four balls. Yeah. Nerves? I don't know. I don't know what it is, but... Would it be... Um, wasn't he pretty injured? Like, he, he had a... Absolutely horrific. Um, yeah. Oh, well, that was in. Um, was that the Blues game? That was the Blues game. Oh, yeah, okay. where so he landed he, on his he neck. He was back for the Rebels after that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm excited about him, but I'm also. I think they need to. They need to stick with him. Yeah, I think so. He's a future prospect. Unfortunately, we're going to be seeing that all season for the Waratahs. Um, that this really isn't going to be the season where they Do are anywhere. particularly excellent. No. Um, they're going to have some bright moments. I, s- I heard someone, um, I was reading an article today that explained it well, that the Waratahs are basically going to be cellar dwellers for this season in the in the Australian Conference, but they're going to come up with unexpected wins at times because they've got talent. Oh, I mean, we were like that last year too. Yeah, but I we had less of an excuse last year. 2015, no, 2018 so saying was the last similar. year we made, <laughs> last year we made the, Quarters. Yeah. Ever since then, we've kind of just been hot and cold. Won games we shouldn't have and lost games that we should have. Yeah. And I mean, a, in my opinion, a big part of that comes down to the issues in our pack. Mm. How much would you... Who, who? How many players would you just give to have Jacques Potkita back? <laughs> Someone that's abrasive... Someone that is going to bend that defensive line, yeah. or like Cliffy Palu. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Oh. I was like, how much I would want Cliffy Palu back? Because I mean, I like Jack Dempsey, but we don't... he doesn't have the line bending capacity of Cliffy Palu. He's not big enough. No, he's not. He's tall. Yeah, but we don't have the uh, Fijian winger. James Ram is the winger's name that you're looking for. That's it, James yeah. Ram. He did. I liked. I liked his. Uh, I liked his game. Yep. Anyway, enough of the tars. Let's move on yeah, to the next one. True. Otherwise, we'll stand the tars for like half an hour. Um, okay, so over to you. Next match. All right. So then we move up to Brisbane for the Reds' second home game of the year. Um, score line 33-23 to the Sharks. Unfortunately. Um, you came around to my place to watch that game. Yeah, we watched that one here. Mm-hmm few good things to come out of that game but also I think a few more bad things unfortunately what was your uh, general impressions of this game I just think the Reds never really got into the game um, a part of it was because of the failures of their set piece um, both in the scrum and the line out mm. so the scrum wasn't dominant like it has been in the last few games the fact that the I would say the first half they were <coughs> they were up there you reckon? Uh, they won a f- number of penalties in that first half. Maybe the tail end has clouded my judgment of Maybe. how their scrum went. Because so. it definitely fell to pieces in the second half. Yeah, it did. Um, their line-out was also really poor. Mm. So Alex Murphy lost a huge number of line-outs. He did. The throws were just inaccurate, just went over the top. There were so many balls that went to the back, whether by mis-throw or they were going for the It must be designed, ball but to he's... O'Connor? I don't know. They must be going for the back because if they're going for O'Connor, then a Reds player is running onto it. Yeah. And he he would either drop it, like, yeah, I reckon they're just going to the back of the line out, 
like the timing is wrong or he's throwing it slightly too high. But basically, because they couldn't have that platform that they actually really benefited from in the previous weeks, like they had no issues with the lineup against the Sunwolves and could run some really nice plays with the mm. attacking the line with that. They just really struggled. Um, One of the things I thought, I was thinking about the game today, um, they were in it. Like, half-time, they were still in it. Yeah. Well, they were up at half-time, weren't they? <laughs> yeah, 19... Yeah. They were just up. 17 or something? Something like that. Um, a few points. And I think, unfortunately, and this is probably going to be the story of their season, again, it comes down to inexperience mm-hmm. and just um, potentially lack of leadership as well. Yeah. Something the Waratahs also have struggled with a little if bit. If you've got Simmons as your captain, you're lacking leadership. I don't think he's a bad human, but... He just doesn't seem like the inspirational type, you know? I haven't... Anyway, we're not going to get anyway, into that. Anyway, sorry. Not back to the tiles. Um, my bad. My bad. It's something I think I've seen, not just within the Reds game particularly, but in Super Rugby, Australian Super Rugby in the last few years, is that the the, te- the Aussie team will be tight, will be in it, mm. and then there'll be five, maybe ten minutes where they just put their foot off the the accelerator or whatever, yeah, yeah. and the other team will run in two easy tries, two yeah. or three easy tries, and then they're out of it. They're yeah. out of the contest. Yeah. And then for the rest of the game, they're either playing catch-up. Um, and so that was the story, I think, of this game. Yeah. Half-time, they came on. They, I think the first probably five minutes, they were going all right, mm-hmm. continue, continued, but then just against the run of play, there was two, I think it was an intercept try and then maybe a turnover or something. But the... Um, the Sharks just ran in two pretty easy tries pretty quickly. And from that point on, I think the Reds just sort of went to pieces, got a bit lost in the mm. game. Um, they were chasing the game at that point and, yeah, they never really recovered. It's pretty worrying to see O'Connor limp off with, what, 20, 30 minutes remaining? Yeah. With, and then have ice put immediately onto his ankle? I haven't heard as of yet. No, I haven't seen anything about it either. Hopefully it's all right. Yeah. That hasn't been, I was checking the Fox Rugby website before and there didn't seem to be anything on there about it. So maybe they're still waiting for tests or maybe it's just not that bad. Um, I'm liking I'm liking O'Connor at 10. Yeah, yeah, me I too. I mean, I kind of thought him coming back, we're looking at a 12 or 13 potentially position for him. Or he was 15. playing 13 at sale for yeah. the last like two years and he's been he's, doing pretty well. Then. But in saying that, coming back to Australia from his form in, in Europe, he's dropped a lot of kgs. Yes, like he's, he was massive he's thinned sale. down. Yeah. I think he had a bad injury over there, though. He had a knee or an ankle injury. Yeah. yeah. And so I think at that point, he put on a bit of weight. But he's looking fit. He's he's doing well in the 10. I, I would rate him up there. Mm. As... We'll get to that conversation Okay, soon. all right. All right, all right. We'll, get, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, one of the things that came from that game that... I just... I think we're going to whinge about it. We're going to have a weekly whinge about something every week. And I think this is tonight's weekly whinge. Is scrum resets, time wasting, yep. um, and I'm sure Australian rugby teams do it as well, but it's just a blight on the game, the fact that you can literally spend six minutes with one scrum. Yeah, 100%. Uh, this this game this week, uh, I've actually seen it in the last two, maybe even three weeks from the Sharks, that they... Their time, their time mm. wasters. Mm. When they get into that last sort of ten minutes, they'll go down. They'll collapse. They'll pre-engage early. They'll do everything they can to get that scrum reset yep. to just eat up the clock. Yep. And in this game, particularly, the ref just allowed it. Yeah. He just let the scrum resets happen and happen and happen, and he didn't hurry them up or anything. I mean, I have fundamentally, I've got no problems with resetting scrums. Mm. Like I don't, I don't mind it from a safety perspective. It needs to be there. Yeah. And I mean, the, the, the issue I have is the time aspect of it. So it's a really simple thing. This is not a unique comment or an original comment because a lot of people have been saying it. Just turn the clock off. That's it. Stop the clock until the ball has been fed into the scrum. Yeah. Once the ball is in, then you restart the clock. That's if right. the scrum goes down and after reset, then stop the clock again. That's right. It's not hard. And yeah, sure, the games themselves will be lengthened, but the actual ball in time play will remain... Pretty appropriate, similar. yeah. And it just means that if you have like a player, one of the things that I'm, I was watching the Jaguares. Who did they play? Jaguares was it, uh, I don't know, Bulls. 
bulls. Yes, bulls. bulls. Cheetahs don't play in Super Rugby anymore. <laughs> They're over in Pro 14 now. I was going to say Chiefs. <coughs> oh, Chiefs. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Jaguares had a player in a bin, but they spent like three or four minutes on one scrum. Yeah. Just eating up the time so they could get their player back as soon as possible. And it's smart. Like, I don't blame the players for doing it because they're trying to win the game mm. but the officials need to make sure that the game remains an enjoyable spectacle, yeah. spectacle for the spectator Yeah, and I think it's going to have to change for next year I think we're getting to the point where there's enough online whinging and I mean rugby league has set the the shot clock for kicks for is it what do they they have a scrum clock I mean, the scrums are useless anyway. Yeah, they need to get rid of it. Don't call it a scrum. Call yeah. it a... Call it a... Huddle. Cuddle, cuddle in the middle. Yeah. A huddle and a cuddle. That, yeah. I like that. Huddle and a cuddle. Huddle and a cuddle. Okay, let's move on. Last two things before we finish up. Um, so, the Sunwolves got pumped by the Canes. We don't really need to say much about that. It's unfortunate. Um, it really is. <coughs> the Sunwolves, that's two weeks in a row that they've conceded more than 50 points. And it's probably going to continue because they've had to have their home games moved to, what, one in Wollongong? And then uh, Brisbane. Yeah, so they're playing double headers with other Aussie conference teams because of all the coronavirus issues. Yeah, I mean, some ways you could look at this as a negative. You could also look at this as a positive. They're, for them, their last game was in... This game was in Waikato. Yep. So there they come across and they play in Sydney this yep. weekend. Yep. That's a lot closer than flying back to Tokyo. Yeah, sure. And then flying to Japan. Oh, I think they were in, meant yeah, to be in Singapore, in Singapore. Yeah. and then they had to go back to Osaka. Yeah. So it's probably less travel for them now to play in Australia for their two games. Yeah, but the home crowd support in Tokyo is off the charts. It's it like, is. It's the best support out of any Super Rugby team. It is. Okay. But so they're, they're really going to be missing that. It's unfortunate that aspect, but at the same time, can't be helped. Coronavirus. Yeah, understand. Is anyway, what it is. Let's move on. Nobody cares about the Sunwolves that much anyway. So, Wallaby Watch. Now, this is something we're going to do now and then, maybe every second week or so, just for a bit of fun. Um, and because, as everybody knows, rugby games are won by the number 10 and the number 10 only. <laughs> so, with that in mind, I think we're going to start choosing our Wallabies number 10 after four rounds of the Super Rugby season. 100%. Okay. So, let's start off. Who are you, If you had to, tonight, pick your number 10. My starting 10? Your starting 10, Yes. For the Wallabies, in the upcoming series opener against Ireland, who would it be? I would play James O'Connor. Talk to me. Tell me more. Why? I just like his game at the moment. I think he... And the Reds in general, when he is at number 10 and he's driving that black line, they are running onto the ball. Like They are moving when they get the ball. They're not stationary. Yeah, okay. (coughs) So when O'Connor gets the ball... He's accelerating onto it, mm-hmm. so he's already making ground. He's not sta- he's not uh, stagnant. Ready Static for a in pass. the pocket, just going to yeah. shuffle it out wide. He um, he's moving. He's energetic. He's quick. He's he's feeding that line. He's also supporting the player as well. He's not just throwing the pass and then mm-hmm. setting up for the next play. He's following through mm-hmm. to create that second man opportunity for the Reds. Yeah, cool. Because if they make that hole. Three out of four times, he's the one that gets that offload and then feeds on to the next guy. Yeah, okay. So cool. he's playing that link game as well, which I really like. What about criticism that you could throw his way in that the game on the weekend, mm. the Reds don't have scrum or forward ascendancy for dominance. Yep. And he looked distinctly average compared to previous He did. Outings. Yeah, he did. He did. So we're going up against an Irish pack that is not as good as it was three years ago. Yep. They're still good though, um, particularly when the Wallabies have had some of their key players. Is like, it Brumbies good? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, the fact that they've who who have the Wallabies lost from the forward pack? They've lost Pocock. They've lost Kepu. They've lost Coleman. They've lost Arnold. Um, Rodder. No, Rodder's still there. Rodder's still there. So those are the main ones. Most of them have gone to London Irish. Three of those four are London Irish now. Actually, no. Um, Arnold's in Japan. Common and Kepi were both at one match. But. And Phipps. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's just... I rate O'Connor. I'm just not sure if he's got the kicking game to serve... To yeah. serve... To, to, to support him if he's not behind a pack that's moving forward. 
But does he have to have that kicking game? Could you not bring in Hodge or Hale Petty to do that? They don't have the tactical kicking game. Mm. You could put Tamur outside him at 12. Yeah. And Tamur could interchange for the players where they know they're going to kick. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I noticed this week in the in the Waratahs, that Kurtley Beal was playing a lot more closer to the 10. Like, he was coming up off fullback to be included in the back line a lot more. Yeah, okay. Than just, like, he was playing 15, but he was getting into the into the line. Mm-hmm. He was coming and giving um, Harrison options as well, which yep. I liked. Yeah, cool. Just probably in that second, that mature and experienced voice giving a second option yeah. to the young kind of fly half. Yeah. Well, um, you mentioned before the fact that you were, you, you asked the question, is he the starting 10? Mm. Does that imply you've got something interesting then for the oh, uh, well, reserves I don't think or the you can't, you can't go past, if we're look, looking at number 10, you can't go past Alessio. He needs to be in that squad. In the broader squad or the match day 23? No, he needs to be in the match day 23. Can you have a standalone number 10 on your bench? Yeah. Really? Yeah, I think Normally so. Normally you need a utility. You could have a utility, but I think uh, he needs the experience. Okay. I would give him maybe one or two games on the bench and then maybe start him on the third one. Okay. See how he goes. Give him some time in the in the environment of the Wallabies mm-hmm. to get familiar with it. To um, I mean, he's what? how old is he? 20? 20, 21? 20. Yeah, he was playing yeah. in the under-20s last year. So, yeah, I, I think he's ready. I think he's ready to, to take that step. He's been the most impressive of the young or the new fly halves. Yeah. Taking Tamua out of the equation yep. because he's more experienced. We know what he offers. Out of the unknowns, which are O'Connor, Harrison, Loisier, or Loisier, he's probably been the best of those three. Consistently, yep. I'd be saying he's the best. He's um, also behind the best pack, though. Yes, definitely. Which feeds back to what I was saying before. Yeah. Well, I'm going to play this game. Um, <coughs> for me... I'd actually be having Will SEO as the starting number 10. You'd put him in at 10? Yeah, I'd put him in at He'd 10. He'd start him? Yeah, why not? Okay. Um, it's only like... Baptism of fire? Yeah, well, the thing is, I'd then be putting Tamua at 12. Okay. Um, as that experienced head who's coming in and taking some of that first receiver duty. So you off play him. like a swap role? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. Tamua's experienced at playing 10. Yep. But he's also really experienced at playing, t- playing 12, so he's a good one to have there. Um... The reason particularly why I'm thinking of SEO is because I'm guessing... Who's going to be our number nine? I'm guessing yeah, it's going to be Joe Powell. Mm, He's yeah, probably... I haven't thought too much about the nine. Yeah, what is it? Him and Tate McDermott are really the two form nines? I mean, you've got Gordon. Gordon's had the experience in the Wallaby yeah, setup. I just don't... I actually don't rate him very I don't. Highly. I don't particularly... I mean, he's got a good off-the-ball game. Like, yeah. I don't know. His box, kick, box kicks aren't very strong. Doesn't None. show much tactical kicking. He has the tendency, in my opinion, to just hover over the ball, a la George Gregan in the twilight years of his career. <laughs> just stand over the ball for, like, ages, waiting yeah. for everyone to be perfectly in position for yeah. them to get hammered by the rush defence. I think you just need someone that's a bit faster in this day and age because rush defence are just in vogue, on vogue. Like, look at what Sean Edwards is doing in France with that. Mm. And yeah. I think Powell offers more energy from the outset. And if you've got Powell then why not have the Brumbies combination of 9-10? Yeah, okay. Um, with Tamura at 12, I mean, I don't mind O'Connor at 10, but they may they may well play Tamura at 10 because he's the most experienced and reliable. You know yeah. what you're going to get with him, and he's good. And he can kick. Yeah, and he can kick as well. But then who do you put at 12? O'Connor. You could. could so it could just be Hodge. O'Connor and Tamura, and it really doesn't matter what's on. Hodge, who do you put Hodge isn't playing. Hodge is injured. Yeah, 13, but he won't Kuru be injured. He, he would, won't be injured in... Yeah, true injury. So where does Hodge come into it, then? I don't think I Hodge feel should. like... I, I think you need Hodge in that. Hodge uh, will kick it from anywhere. Yeah. Hodge is the Wallabies kicker. <coughs> um, from range, Tamura will take the kicking duties if he's in the team. What's his stats like, though? I have no idea, <laughs> but I feel like they're better <laughs> than most others. Um, anyway, we're actually getting into the point where we're now selecting the entire wall of his back line. So yeah, let's just stick yeah, away. Um, your vote, James O'Connor. My yeah. vote, Noel Ellis here. Sound good? Lock it in. Okay. Well, um, why don't we finish it up there? 
And I just want to say thank you, everybody, for listening. The many people I'm sure that are out there listening to the very all first... of our fans, <laughs> all of our fans. I'm pretty sure my mum will listen, so that's really helpful. <laughs> um, <coughs> this has been the first episode of Pick and Drive Rugby Podcast. I am Mark Ando Anderson, and we have Mitch Mitch Foster. What a legend! <laughs> and we're going to sign off and bid you all a wonderful week. Until next week, thanks so much. Go Tars. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Pick and Drive Rugby Podcast. You can follow us on social media at the following outlets. Follow our Facebook page at Pick and Drive Rugby Podcast. Send us a tweet at at pick underscore drive rugby. Follow our Instagram at pick underscore drive underscore rugby. Or send us an email at pickanddriverugby at gmail.com. We'd love to hear any questions or feedback you may have, so get in touch. Thanks again for listening and we'll catch you next week.